Okay, class. In this unit, we'll talk about tendons. Uh, so tendons, in terms of their molecular composition, this will kind of be the general format that we'll have um, going for for the next uh, several connective tissues. So um, are comprised primarily of, um, uh, the, or their dry weights, primarily collagen. So the ECM of uh, tendons, um, you know, 60 to 80% are these um, collagen fibers. Most of that is going to be type 1 with a small level of type 3, type 5, type, I think that's type 11, type 12, and type 14. Um, the collagen fibers uh, uh, are aligned along the long axis, um, uh, typically in the direction where that tissue is going to be loaded, and provide excellent you know, uniaxial strength to the tendon. So in one direction, right? They're aligned in parallel to each other. Um, the non sorry. The non-collagenous proteins um, include proteoglycans, which we talked about, glycoproteins, and glycogenates. Again, um, remembering proteoglycans, the role with kind of having this almost uh, hydrophilic function that you know, brings water into the tissue, which kind of keeps, keeps shape within the extracellular matrix. And like all connected tissues, tendons have a, you know, a complex cells, you know, um, and, and surrounding extracellular matrix performs a bunch of different roles. Um, an appropriate composition organization of the ECM enables a tendon to do its job. And its primary job is force transfer and like protection of the muscle. Um, you know, and the, uh, a well-functioning ECM, as we'll see again with tons of other tissue we'll talk about, is crucial um, for the, the maintaining the, the health and function um, of that connective tissue. The extracellular matrix is crucial. So tendon functions, right? Primary job of tendon is to transmit forces um, from a muscle to a bone um, and facilitating movement. It's also really important for protecting. Um, so for a, a, a tendon's function to be efficient, we want it to be able to resist tensile forces with limited elongation. We don't want them to be able to be super stretchy. Um, they should have some resistance or I think we call it stiffness. That's not the same as when you think of like a stiff joint. We want them again to have a little bit of resistance. Um, uh, now, some tendons have an additional role. Uh, they stretch when loaded to store energy, and they release that back into the system uh, to improve energy of motion. So we see that the Achilles tendon in locomotion. Um, unfortunately, energy storing tendons, which kind of makes sense, are more prone to injury because they're kind of storing and transmitting energy. Um, so they're a little bit higher prone. And um, that's why we see, like, um, you know, Achilles injuries, right? They are often um, in terms of tendon ruptures and like the consequences on human movement because they lose that force generating capacity or energy return. So you see sprinting, leaping, hopping um, performance uh, suffer. Now, tendon functions well, something I don't think people like realize um, that again, they have this protective role. So when they're exposed to stresses, their ability to stretch and recoil serves a protective role to the muscles by preventing high forces from being transmitted to the muscles. So it's a, a, a kind of a double benefit. Um, and it's kind of best described here where we see with eccentric contractions. So during an eccentric contraction, again, like when it's being stretched, right, along its longitudinal axis, um, they move out of phase with the muscle fibers. Um, this occurs because during the lengthening period, almost all that accommodation of motion um, occurs in the tendon, right? It's accommodated almost exclusively by the tendon while the muscle fibers remain the same length. This has an advantage because it allows the muscles to stay at an optimal length tension for the subsequent contraction, right? Um, it also prevents or spares the muscles from a uh, high power stressors, right? Like, like you would get maybe with running, right? Um, if you're planting on that leg, right? Again, think of the eccentric contraction that has to occur in the, in the Achilles, right? And what that could potentially do if that was all going into the muscle versus having this really healthy, robust tendon. And again, the, the, again, thinking about like the value of having that stiff or re resistant tendon that's able to accommodate, um, accommodate uh, those forces without stretching and then overstretching and transmitting those forces to the muscle. So it's a kind of a happy medium. Now, this occurs again because of tendons again are arranged in that in that parallel uh, direction along the longitudinal axis. I have next to here tendon ligaments, uh, tendons and ligaments here. 
Uh, tendons and ligaments, like compositionally, are almost exactly the same. Their orientation is a little bit different, and there's slight differences in terms of the exact percentage, but they're made up of the same basically constituents. Um, so uh, the key cell in tendons are tenocytes. These um, are referred to almost as tendon specific fibroblasts. Uh, but either way, they're responsible for uh, turnover and maintenance of the ECM. Again, the ECM is crucial for, for a lot of these cells. And they re react to external stimuli and facilitate adaptations of the proteoglycan and collagen networks within the ECM uh, to those new mechanical environments, right? So they, you know, help produce you know, more collagen or stuff like that, more proteins in response to those uh, stressors. And we'll talk about the remodeling in a bit. And here's just a, a, a schematic depiction of, of what we're seeing again. Again, they're they're broken down in series. Um, so it's a schematic depiction of you know, the transverse section showing fibril and fascicle packing of um, all the tropic collagen with um, fibrils, fibers, and fascicles within a tendon, and then and an image here of uh, a tenocyte. And uh, one thing I want to stress as well too that I don't think people like realize that tendons are not avascular; like they do have a blood supply. Um, it is limited, like they are hypovascular, but they are not avascular. They, they do get a blood supply. And the vascular supply um, to the tendon has been shown to rise from three distinct areas, which kind of makes sense if you think about the anatomy. The musculoskeletal tendinous junction, the osteotendinous junction, the vessels from various surrounded connective tissues like the paratendon, the mesotendon, and the venicula. And the, the vessels are arranged longitudinally kind of along with the tendon, which kind of makes sense as well, too. Um, so, again, they're not avascular. They are hypovascular, um, but they're not avascular. Now, tendon remodeling, um, because it is, because it is um, hypovascular, its, it's adaptation is slow. It's slow, but it does happen. Tendons can thicken and strengthen in response to use. Uh, tendon cells, the tenocytes, govern the production and organization of the tendon matrix in response to mechanical and chemical cues. And then matrix turnover is modulated by, by response to local strains, which adapt the matrix so they can kind of tolerate. Uh, so the same uh, electrical load stimulus like isn't experienced exactly the same. So basically, they you know they they adapt um, the the tendon over time to mechanical stimuli. Now. One thing I do want to stress is that normally tendons do not rupture on their stress. It's kind of rare. It can happen if you have an acute, like, hyper overload of a tendon. It can fail, but very rarely. Again, like, type 1 collagen is stronger than steel, right? So, like, it, it's pretty strong. Um, you'd have to do something kind of completely out of, out of ordinary to, to rupture it. Now, more commonly, though, again is that the tendon itself is unhealthy from either chronic overuse and like not, you know, allowing it to heal and remodel, or it's been de you know, degenerated uh, from like tendinopathy, which weakens uh, the tendon and makes it more vulnerable to rupture. Tendinopathy, we think, is a, is a temporal, multifactorial process likely initiated by overuse. We're not exactly sure um, if the initial driving factor is matrix disruption um, or a cellular response leading to like altered loading conditions. Either way, both are probably involved. Both lead to weakening of a tendon leading to the, a higher risk of rupture. So tendinopathy has three distinct phases. We're not going to spend a ton of time talking about this, but we can't talk about healing and repair without talking about what causes damage to tendons. Again, acute rupture, not super common, but this is can be kind of common. So reactive tendinopathy, it's an acute reversible process brought by a rapid increase in mechanical loading beyond its typical like um, uh, um, uh, load tolerance. So tendon swells due to increase in water retention and is proposed to be a protective response to reduce stress along the collagen. Remember the proteoglycans that are within the, the extracellular matrix. And then if it pro progresses, you can have tendon uh, disrepair, um, which is, can follow if loading exceeds tendon capacity for a substantial period of time. We have increased fiber diameter, probably likely do that water retention, uh, but you start having matrix breakdown and there's evidence of neural and vascular ingrowth. Um, like most tissues like this, like most connective tissues, like neovascularization, not typically a normal finding. So every time you see, we see the presence of it, that means there's probably something going on, some damage occurring. 
And then there's degenerative tendinopathy when it, it releases, reaches a degenerative state where we've got you know, the collagens completely disorganized, there's advanced matrix breakdown, and then the fiber thickness increases. So um, you, know, you might see this in some patients with like chronic uh, Achilles tendinopathy, have these like thicker, um, weirder looking Achilles tendons. And it's because of this kind of haphazard, maybe this, this, uh, this um, um, secretion and displacement of, um, of, of collagen and this disorganization of the ECM. Now, tendons can heal. Again, tendons can heal, right? Uh, there is evidence that tendon repair can occur intrinsically from tendocytes, different extrinsic mechanisms, loading, progressive loading. Um, you know, um, and importantly, again, like it's not avascular, right? Um, but if we have permanent disruption to the vessels, right, um, you know, it will cause, you know, it, it will make it much harder to heal and cause uh, disintegration of collagen bundles. So uh, the initial response of tendon healing is this like neovascularization. Again, anytime we see that, there suggests damage. Like we saw again with, you know, uh, tendon disrepair, we have that like neovascularization and ingrowth. Again, it's p- probably part of the healing process as well too. And again, that's a sign that something something's awry. So this is a great um, uh, continuum infographic by Jill Cook, who is probably the preeminent leader um, in uh, global leader in uh, tendon research. She, she does a lot of great work. Uh, publishes showing that it's a continuum. Like your tendons do need mechanical loading, right, to to be maintained. In fact, like lack of movement is really not great for tendons. Uh, But if we exceed it, we can get this reactive tendinopathy, which can lead to tendon disrepair, which can lead to um, degeneration, right? So there's a continuum um, along along, the load and time uh, exposed to uh, tendon. So uh, that's tendons in a nutshell. Uh, next section we'll cover are ligaments, kind of its um, its cousin or close cousin in a certain sense. All right.